there, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Den of Sin. I, I, my, my mind went blank there for a second. I was like, "What is the name of this podcast?" I think it's because uh, it's been too long. It's it's been too long. Uh, I, you know, I, I have old man brain at this point, anyways. Um, <laughs> even though some of this, I was trying to recall some of the films I wanted to see tonight and hit on some plot points, and then I was like, "God damn, I know I like that movie, but I can barely remember anything about it." Um, Old man brain is really in full swing. But yeah, Devin, it's great to see you. Uh, it's great to see you virtually. This is always something I look forward to. But, you know, life is, I'm sure all of our listeners and people out there in the world know, like, life right now is a little crazy for everybody. Yeah, the um, whole world has had a very strange November. Yes, uh, exactly. So don't want to get too much into that. Let's not waste our time. Uh, but I am excited to do this episode. Uh, this episode, when we talked about doing this podcast, this was one of the first topics I'd originally thought of uh, in a specific way. It's this is a weird, this is a very complicated quote unquote genre. And I don't know if it's even its own genre. It's too big of a concept. We want to tell the uh, our listeners uh, tonight, Devin, what we're actually going to be talking about. I would love to. Uh, this is a return to a genre uh, discussion. Uh, usually we talk about a particular year or a particular artist, whether they be in front or behind the camera. Uh, so far, the only genre we've tackled is werewolf movies. And that was uh, back during the summer. And that was a, a great episode, too. Uh, but uh, this time we agreed we wanted to do another genre, and you suggested revenge movies. And I got to right. be honest, I uh, I tensed up a little bit, like in the sense of God, I just don't know what a revenge movie conversation would sound like in 2020. This could be interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I I've been looking forward to it. I I will confess, in doing the research for this one, I research every one of our episodes. This was the first one that felt a little bit like homework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because going through everything that the world's going through, and of course you and I have had things going on in our own lives as well, uh, there's there's a certain level to which uh, <laughs> it got difficult to watch Vengeance on a multiple yeah. night, multiple times a night uh, level right in the middle of all this. Like I, I have a copy of Popeye that I bought on Black Friday that I'm, That's right. I'm dying to pop on as soon as this is over to just kind of <laughs> sit back and watch something that does not have uh, mutilation or rape or uh, any of those. Not that I dislike the genre. I, I've been looking forward to that part of it. And some of these I very much enjoyed either seeing for the first time or seeing again. Uh, what was your uh, reason for suggesting it? Well, so originally when I, my, so the main thing I've been wanting to talk about in depth, because it's so, sort of a subgenre that I am passionate about is vigilante film. Specifically, you know, man takes, you know, justice into his own hands, kind of 70s had a lot of these movies. Some of my favorite movies, movies like Rolling Thunder, uh, Vigilante, the Robert Forrester movie, Vigilante, which is a huge, uh, one of my favorite movies. There's a lot of those movies. But but then I I chose revenge films specifically because I was thinking about one of the films specifically was Thriller, A Cruel Picture, or as it's known in the States, uh, they call her One Eye. And that's not really a vigilante movie. It is more of a, a straight revenge movie. And it is a sort of, people refer to it as a rape revenge movie, but that's not, uh, that's not actually accurate. But that's the thing about this topic is that it's kind of ambiguous as far as overall even what is a revenge film because if you really think about it the majority of films have some sort of revenge element what there's always going to be a whether it's a movie like karate kid or a movie like legally blonde i mean there's uh, the most and not, has revenge all through it yeah ex exactly so there's revenge is going to be kind of a, a, a universal plot point in, in a lot of cinema the thing i wanted to talk about specifically is where it's it the revenge is the main crux of the story there's a difference between vengeance and justice and i sometimes absolutely i'm glad you brought that up yeah and i think a lot of times people don't understand that distinction you know while vengeance and somebody trying to you know right or wrong and a lot of times whether it's a cop trying to bring a killer to justice or like a movie like aaron brockovich which is she's trying to you know get these poor people in this small town justice like legal justice but there's a difference between that and then the very much more personal um, and hu more human, like justice is a is something we should strive for. Where vengeance isn't really something. It's a weird mire to kind of get into because on one hand, it's something we can all relate to. We've all been ro felt wronged in our life, and we always every human being on earth has wanted to get revenge of some kind. But it's not a good. It's not a good thing. Vengeance isn't a good thing. In fact, a lot of films I'll talk about tonight talk about the emptiness of vengeance. But at the same time, there's something very. 
obviously when you go into revenge films, there was a lot of, you can take that topic into some pretty harsh places, some very dark places and explore some really dark themes, which could be tantalizing, can be tantalizing. And it's, I'm definitely a fan of the more exploitation er, end of the, the pool on this yeah. subgenre, but it's definitely, you can take it in a lot of different ways, but it is different. Like a movie, like say, I think of a good example of like a film that's about justice, like a, somebody trying to like you know bring a criminal to justice or or you well, know get stuff justice. Like, uh, there's a lot of that in like the western genre. There's some great revenge exactly. westerns too, and I, I definitely plan to to bring up a western or two just at least as a name drop. But sure, uh, something like High Noon, where she goes and and uh, hires Rooster Cogburn to uh, to track down her father's killers. I, I contemplated whether that was a revenge film because it's a little girl. Uh, she, she's a, a teenager, I believe, looking for vengeance against the people who, who killed her father. And there's definitely that part of it. But the fact that she asks a, a, a crusty old marshal, I think invalidates the revenge end of it. Uh, it's, it's like you said, um, it, it cannot be, the revenge must be personal. And there, therefore the, the assault must be personal as well. Uh, not that, Exactly. Not the true grit didn't have a personal assault. That was her father, but it, I'm glad you. I think you originally it, you said high noon. I'm glad you corrected. I think. I'm sorry. I, said, I'm sorry. Yeah. You said true, and I was like, you're talking about true grit. As soon as you true said Richard Cogburn, but I'm so. But sorry. you know, I would nobody on earth can question your your knowledge <laughs> of uh, western. So, um, but you just did. But one, uh, though. but yeah, and I, I'm glad you. <laughs> I'm glad you said that though, because I was going to bring up the topic of Unforgiven, which is a very similar. Yes. kind of you know bigger picture plot but people say that's a revenge film and i'm like it's not the the last bit of it is a revenge film yeah the the reckoning when clint eastwood shows up in in the town and, and takes everyone down for killing his friend ned exactly that part's revenge but i i think the the simple way to put it is that revenge cannot be achieved through hire you can have friends yes. you can have connections and they will have friends and connections in in a lot of these movies but the revenge, first of all, the trauma has to be soul shattering and it has to be soul shattering enough that these characters who you are to believe are generally decent people with, with some exception. The only way that they can feel complete again is to not only stoop to the villain's level, but lower uh, yeah. to where frequently the vengeance visited upon the antagonist is much more severe or, or violent than the uh, initial assault. Uh, which I agree a hundred percent leads you to question in your soul, which one really is worse? You know, I mean, the, is it really stooping to the level or whatever? And I think that's part of why revenge films are still being made and why there's still some really solid ones being made uh, in the recent years uh, is because it is a very human emotion to, to imagine like, what would I do uh, in this situation? Uh, we we've all thought it at some point or another, and there are those of us that watch it in movies and, and when they're really rough, they will stay with you all day long, which I almost think is the, the feeling that we're hoping for when we watch these movies. Because there's not much you can hope for in like a I Spit on Your Grave or Thriller, A Cruel Picture. I don't yeah. watch them to enjoy them. In fact, I hardly watch them at all. I had to blow dust off of a couple of my Blu-rays here uh, because these are not Saturday afternoon movies. For whatever reason, and I'll, I'll leave it to the psychologist to explore why necessarily, yeah. but there is some sort of side to us that wants to explore this darker element of us and, and think about what you do. Because, of course, if you're given 10 seconds longer to contemplate, you think, well, of course, you go to the authorities and you try to do things the right way. But there are a lot of us who, I, I can tell you right now, I am a nonviolent person. I've never been in a fight in my life. But you intentionally hurt one of my cats in front of me, I might break your soul in two. Yeah. <laughs> and that's my cat. That's not saying yeah. about my my wife, my child, my my family, my friends, anything like that. So uh and and this film touches upon those things. And and ultimately film is art and art is supposed to give you the feels. Yeah. So this is a particular kind of feel. It's it's almost like the the ghost pepper of cinema. Some people can have it and some people can't and generally the people who can't think that those who are doing it are absolutely insane because they usually are i can't i can't take a ghost pepper uh but i can <laughs> but i can watch the ghost pepper of of movies because uh I, I want to experience that i i dare myself to experience that sometimes yeah i mean i don't necessarily i i will say like i do i i'm very aware that i do get a very there is a sort of visceral satisfaction i do get from watching 
a cinematic, a vile cinematic character get some cup muppets. And I think, exactly. I think we can project our own self being like people who have, even if they're not per like you think of, you know, just we'll say people in politics or people you don't like. And, you know, the people who you feel have done wrong things and just have never gotten theirs. Like karma hasn't bitten them on their, a- on their asses yet. And you can sometimes project that. But I, I do feel like, you know, I'll say this preface right even before we start. One of the main, in the, in the over arcing overarching genre if it is a genre which it's it's really not a genre but there it's is a subgenre i think it's a qualifiable it's a, subgenre i agree I, with you but i will say that a, a subgenre i guess of the subgenre to make it more complicated yeah. is the rape revenge movie and yes. there are a lot of people who can't watch those and i i fully get it i'm not a i'm not a rape survivor and as a as a large man you know it's not something i i've had to for the most part go through my life in fear of but at the same time as somebody with empathy um, as a human being, like one, I can totally understand why some people just can't enjoy them or, you know, just find them repellent, of course. But for me, it's a matter of, uh, I focus more on the revenge than the rape aspect of that film. And again, a a film, a film, and I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit, you know, but uh, a very important film in that subgenre, obviously something like I spit in your grave. Yeah. By the end of the movie, I'm rooting for her to exact very violent, uh, you know, hellish revenge on her attackers. Now, again, that's not for everybody. Um, I just recently uh, got, I, as at this age of my life, I, I avoid online arguments or even online hard discussions at all as much as humanly possible, which is something I can't say about myself even 10 years ago. But I was watching a, or saw something on YouTube and there was a discussion in the threads about how like you know and the guy in the in the youtube video basically gave a warning like you know like hey this does have rape in this and trigger, oh, and trigger warning we should give trigger warning every every movie we are about to discuss not just the rape of it, everything should probably yeah. come with a trigger warning on this uh episode just absolutely <laughs> sorry but this guy but... I, no worries but you know there's like I, you know and i can only i can only presume he's some teenager young white guy in his 20s but he's like i don't this is such bullshit i hate trigger ones like oh well you tell me rape is worse than you know all the murder you talk about in these horror movies and i was like dude it's because there are actual survivors of rape yeah there are very very few survivors of murder like uh (laughs) Uh, in theory there are none well that, i mean the thing is i actually made that in fact i said my original point was actually there are zero survivors of murder but then people there is attempted murder and blah blah, blah which is i'm sure a pretty horrific thing to to live through but again sure. there are millions of survivors of rape and it's but a hard thing it's like you know getting into the gradation of the evils of man is is yeah. kind of a losing argument the moment Absolute. you start into it absolutely but again it's like what what does it harm the world if you god forbid look out for somebody who may you know anyways let's that's not what we're here to talk about but i do think it's an interesting aspect of it but having said that what i again to go back to my original point is i do there is there is some part of me that i could sit and watch 10 hours a day of very gory violent revenge films and be okay because again it's like it's the same thing like you know aggressive music you know a lot of like you know very visceral hard uh aggressive punk music metal music like there's there's it there's a you're there you very you know typically there's a sense of uh your it's you you're venting it out you're getting it out through that kind of thing and i i feel the same way about film in general but specifically these kinds of movies but but having said that devin you know obviously we could talk about revenge movie movies that feature revenge as a main plot point forever. I mean, this is, this could be yeah. its own podcast, but there's obviously ones that I feel like we definitely need to talk about. Yeah. But did you have? Did, well, just to clarify, to to start off, um, I think we're both agreeing on on all of these little sub sub points. Uh, the main yes. point of a revenge film, if you're going to put a definition on what is a revenge film. It's deceptively simple, but it's simply a revenge movie is about revenge. It is not a plot point to something else. It is not uh, something that is achieved. Like, vengeance doesn't happen, and then, like, there's no and yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, this is a person who is going to seek revenge, and they don't care about what happens the moment that that's over. Yes. Um, and that's got to be, it's really all about the the mind frame of the, the character in a lot of ways. Uh, and it's very it was pretty much damn near impossible to find a, a, a comedy that was a revenge movie. Uh, Cause I think by our definition, the trauma that incites the revenge needs to be so brutal that uh, while there are funny moments uh, in, yeah. in lots of these revenge movies, there are funny moments. They never really become full comedy. I don't think that it's appropriate. Uh, and, and I'm not arbitrarily saying appropriate. I just don't think that that 
is an example of what people mean when they say revenge films. Uh, yeah. They're sure as hell not talking about Revenge of the Nerds. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's funny. I'm glad you made that reference because I was going to make that reference as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I will say like in modern times, we have these giant blockbuster movies. I mean, one of the most popular franchises right now is a revenge film. It's a very simple story of a, you know, John Wick, obviously, is what I'm talking yes. about. Um, but, you know, it's a it's a giant, at this point, it was a, you know, it's a trilogy, you know, now it's going to keep going on. But it's literally the story of a guy who's getting revenge for these, you know, criminals killing his, his dog and uh, stealing his car. That's it. That's literally the plot point. And it just has steamrolled into this bigger thing. But for a long time, if you were talking about a revenge movie, you were talking about movies that were really on the fringe, movies that upset a lot of people. I really don't think until Quentin Tarantino did Kill Bill, which is in itself an homage to two very, I mean, multiple, but two specifically that he's mentioned, amazing legendary revenge films in Thriller, A Cruel Picture, as I already mentioned, and also Lady Snowblood. But like until then, like that idea was still pretty much a genre film that, you know, you would see either straight to video or just a much smaller release film. But I think Kill Bill was a huge epic that was, yeah. you know, very popular that was very much inspired by the films we're going to talk about. And I think since Kill Bill, you know, obviously, and again, there's been tons of Hollywood, big budget Hollywood movies that featured revenge as a plot point, but not what you would consider a quote. Exactly. And it's also, just... I really want to say, too, for the fucking internet, uh, Taken is not a revenge film. It's not a fucking revenge film. Stop saying it is. It's not what it is. It's a rescue film. I mean, even as you go into the trilogy of it, like, but again, it's not a fucking revenge film. Stop saying it is. It drives me fucking crazy when I see it pop up on there. Uh, there is a Liam Neeson movie on my list here. Uh, it's arguably a revenge film, but it is not Taken. I'll get into that in a little bit. I, I do have sure. some a, a handful of is it a revenge film type questions. Okay, uh, Unforgiven was almost one of them, but I, I I'm glad you brought it up on its own because I, I think it does make a lot of lists. But there's a lot of Clint Eastwood on the re actual revenge list, so yeah, uh, so you're not wrong with Unforgiven. But in Unforgiven, he is a it, revenge for hire. Let's. I guess let's just go ahead and start with the elephant in the room and get into the rape revenge movies because they're too big a part of the discussion to ignore them. Sure. And uh, not so much get them out of the way because I think of them less creatively, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think we might have a little more fun as we go along if we get those out of the way. Sure. And these are the films, by and large, that did inspire Kill Bill. But a lot of these are the earliest forms of revenge films. And uh, the, the rape revenge is definitely something that uh, is not just controversial today. They, they were controversial the moment they came out. Oh and, yeah. Uh, let's, I guess uh, the most prominent one, not the earliest one, but the most prominent one is I spit on your grave. Yes. I, I would say it's, it's the sort of quintessential. I, I, I am a fan of it. In fact, I'm actually we a weirdly a fan of even the remakes and the sequels to the remake. I, I feel like, have things about them that i enjoy i haven't seen any of the remakes and there is an official sequel out now that i will see but i uh, didn't get around to it may not even it's definitely out but it may not be easily available right now you mean to the original the the the, the um sequel to to the very I first think. i spit on yeah, your grave in it's fact like if the you same buy... actress is back and the same director is back yes so yeah um yes you are correct yeah it's it's the thing is like it's a very interesting movie it's it's not People have said it's a bad movie. It's not a fucking bad movie at all. It's no, the not. performances it's, are great. The, even the, the the film looks great, especially yeah. for that time period. Um, it's just what it was dealing with was so ugly. But again, the one thing that, like, yes, there is obviously a very exploitative element to it. But again, the thing that I, I – it's still about revenge, and it still is a woman – you know, it's like there was a whole take back the, the night movement of the late 70s and early 80s, which was a real thing. Like women trying to like learn self-defense, be more, you know, uh, own their own strength and power and being, you know, being able to defend themselves and stuff. And I think there is a power to that. And I think revenge films specifically had a, even there's a element of that even in that in that actual movement. But again, there's something if you as a man, you know, I, I'll I mean, as you know. I don't know what it's like to be that kind of victim in, of that kind of crime, but I'm sure getting that kind of revenge in it, in it I, we could talk about the morality of, of revenge and of vengeance and if it's a thing real, like if it's a, if it's a healing thing or not. One of the movies I want to talk about explores that specifically, but, but there is, it's, it is completely cathartic and it's completely understandable when, you know, especially in that. And the one thing you can say, especially in the, uh, in the remake um, where some of the kills get real, like 
complicated and a little unbelievable, they're still so visceral and they're still so ugly that like, you know, for the, there, it's rare that you can see that kind of violence in a movie and root most horror films, most things like the victims of that violence are innocent people or people who are relatively innocent in these kind of movies. The person who's getting tortured to the point of death or, you know, getting mutilated is somebody that you're kind of like, fuck yeah, cut his balls off. There's something cathartic about that. But in the case of uh, I, I Spit on Your Grave, too, this movie came out in 1978, if anyone is, is uninitiated. My guess uh, is that it was probably shot two or three years prior to that. I, I know it, didn't, it wasn't released the same year it was shot. It had an uphill battle. And it, it was initially released under the title Day of the Woman. And the director claims to have uh, basically have found in, in real life, driving down the country road or something, found a, uh, a rape victim and was able to, to take her to the police. And in the process of taking care of her and taking her to the police, started to realize that the police were not going to be able to help her. Or I can't remember the exact story, but the true story was either the police were unable to help her or unwilling to help her. Uh, but he was appropriately disgusted. And this movie was his reaction to it. And that filmmakers, especially exploitation filmmakers, will find lots of ways to excuse bad behavior that they put on screen, which you and I tend to, to love those movies. But uh, either way, there, there have been some uh, rather relevant arguments as to whether or not some of these directors should have been able to get away with some of the things that they did. But you can usually smell the snow, the, the showmanship uh, behind their slick answer of, you know, well, it's really a female empowering movie. And yeah. the next movie I want to talk about, th this is the, exactly that kind of director. He was really a sleazeball. But the guy that did I Spit on Your Grave, and he's only ever done I Spit on Your Grave, to this day, or now he's done the, the, the official sequel, uh, but to this day, he still fights the fact that it's called I Spit on Your Grave because he prefers the name Dave the Woman and really seems to have legitimately made this from a sincere place. What's rough about it is that sincerity goes into the film and what results is, I think, still the record holder for the longest rape scene in history uh, goes on for over 20 minutes. So a good full like act of this movie is rape and psychological chase. Uh, and physical yeah, because the forest because she's actually yeah. raped multiple times by a Ex that's, she's, yeah. she's gang raped but not to, to use the most unfortunate parlance i could think of at the moment she it wasn't a train it wasn't it was yeah throughout the day while she's on the run from these guys trying to get back home and it is exactly incredibly brutal to watch it's probably the hardest movie on our any of our lists to really recommend it to the common listener but the effect is like I said, it will stay with you for the rest of the day. You can't just watch that movie and then go about your business. Uh, you have to think about what was done to her and what she did, does in return. And it really is satisfying uh, to see her come out of it on top. They don't know that she's alive. And so she gets to pull complete surprise attacks on these assholes. Yeah. And you're right. It's, it's completely satisfying. Somehow by the end, you feel like it was, you were somehow rewarded for watching this movie, which is weird. Yeah, and I think even the film does some things that I think m more nuanced than somebody might think, it's especially from a title like I Spit in Your Grave. But, you know, it's even in, I think it's more explored maybe in, in the remake as well. But, you know, there's even the reluctant member of the rape party who... Oh, yes, does, you're right, you're yeah, right. Yeah, and there's an element like when he's about to get his comeuppance, as a man, there's a maybe an element of the male audience that's like, oh, well, he didn't mean it, but guess what? fuck that like you did it you have to check your, yeah he's still he a was piece coerced of into joining his uh ne'er-do-well friends and he's yep. in, a, in a lot of ways he's actually the most problematic character in the whole thing because he's he's clearly a special needs like uh yes. lear learning uh yeah in in, in, the, in the remake he's not as like emotionally he's more of just like the weakest member of the party which i think is a little bit more uh digestible <laughs> but yeah in in the original one they exactly like he's sort of a learning disabled like yeah he has some emotional issues but but again i think that's an interesting layer to that film that other films might not have explored you're absolutely um, right but you know there's a lot i mean uh, you have a movie like the virgin spring which is a fucking masterpiece uh, it's you know, it's a movie i love yeah in its own way for me it's harder to watch 
you take away the exploitative elements of something like I Spit on Your Grave, and ra- rape is always rape. There's no fucking, there's no dancing around it. It's it's a very uncomfortable, awful thing to watch, even fictionalized, even dramatized. But there's something like The Virgin Spring, which approaches it in a in a very like matter of in a weird. On the one hand, it's very almost poetic, and and there, I mean. It's Ingmar Bergman, so if you've seen Ingmar Bergman films, you know what to expect. But yeah, this is an art house movie. Yeah, exactly, and it's you know very weirdly matter of fr- fact, but it's also very human. After the two, uh, whatever you want to call them, the two, uh, you know, because the film is it takes place, I think, in like the 1400s. But these two guys, like after they're done, it's this awkward like not necessarily a sense of regret as I don't know if that's, you know, really what the element there is, but this weird, like post rape kind of like silence and this sort of like uncomfortableness. And it's really fucking disturbing because we're so used to seeing these characters being portrayed as vile, you know, one dimensional like monsters that to see them show any kind of actual human element is even more disturbing because it makes it more real. And I think, you know, um, when Wes Craven did Last House on the Left, he, which is, for those that don't know, uh, is also a rape, revenge, although it's not the, in the original, it's not the, uh, the, the you poor young girl doesn't survive. It's her parents who end up taking revenge, which I still think is legitimate because it, that's as personal as it gets. I, I um, had to think of, I had to wonder myself if Last House on the Left, the original was a, in fact a revenge film. And I, I cited on, yes, it doesn't follow yeah. every rule, but, but it is, it's there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, like, if and it's I'm, based like, on Virgin Spring, by the way. That's where the the well, that's, just that's what I was going to say. Yeah, for yeah. So that was my point. Is yeah. like, you know, I can imagine audience at the time when he's like, "Oh, it's based off of Virgin Spring, the Michael Bergman movie." Some people might have rolled their eyes, but it, if you watch them, you're like, "Yes, it obviously is." But that was one element, you know, in Last House on the Left, which he took directly from the Virgin Spring, which is making that weird sort of post crime human awkwardness, this sort of silence of like, uh, well, you know. Again, I don't know if it's regret because the those char- both characters don't really seem to show too much apparent regret. Again, maybe it's internalized. It's just this humanness of like, like I mean, you know, because afterwards you ra- you don't go high five your buddy. I mean, you know, that's just so it's just there's this there weird was an hum- element of that in in I spit on your grave though. They were kind of a high five vibing kind of. Well, that's group what I'm saying. Dudes. But yeah. exact, well, that's what I'm saying. So that's like in a way like that's there's this exploitative element in that and this sort of like I said they're portrayed as like these like despicable inhuman cartoonish villains but you know there's showing it showing a film showing them as be having human elements of being like real people like and making them almost have a moment of humanity makes it more despicable in its own in its weird way and at least it makes it more uncomfortable to me as much as i do love the the movie virgins the virgin spring um it's that moment it's very it's hard it's it's just it's very heartbreaking um and then the ugly violence that happens as well but but yeah it's the the rape revenge films are very much not for everybody i no. will say a movie that, that i was gonna bring up later but does tie into now um which is one of my favorite revenge movies ever that is much more of a almost like a comic book take on the idea is uh in fact I, you can think you can see the poster in my background there uh which is uh the Savage Streets, the Linda uh-huh. Blair film, which, you know, does have uh, a very, you know, awful rape scene. A very young Linnea Quigley plays her sister who is deaf and these cartoonishly over the top 80s young thug punks uh, guys end up, you know, raping her in high school and then later on and, you know, end up also killing her. And then later on, they throw one of their her friends off of a fucking bridge off the off an overpass in Los Angeles. But to me, it's like it's so there. It's just such a not that you don't take the rape seriously, but because the movie's such a like a stylized film that it's you know you know where the movie's going and yeah. just watching Linda Blair fucking own her. I mean, she's so. <laughs> I still think it's my favorite Linda Blair performance, and she's so, she is basically fucking like she's at the beginning she's like a typical 80s like mall girl kind of valley girl kind of girl uh all about like you know being cool and 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 you know uh and then the movie she's fucking batman yeah she's not quite that like i I, i'm with you on savage streets is is really enjoyable it's um and i wanted to bring it up too because i i really love watching that movie and that was 
one of the higher spots of this was uh, <laughs> in the middle of all these, I, I did get to go back and revisit Savage Streets. I, I will say, I feel that I Spit on Your Grave is a good picture, and I feel like Last House is a great picture, uh, whereas mm-hmm. Savage Streets, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, great doesn't spring to mind, and I still think that she is, uh, her Linda Blair's best performance is and always will be The Exorcist. I'm, I'm sorry to, to say to her that she peaked so young. Um, but uh, there was something about her puffy little cheeks. Um, yeah, that she, she's not supposed to be a ditzy Valley girl. They're supposed to be like almost well, a girl gang. They're supposed to, it, this movie really, it, it rests rather uncomfortably between switchblade sisters and Lords of Flatbush. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> where, where they're a girl gang, but really they're a girl gang that likes to hang out and walk around LA and, and look and sound tough. Yeah, exactly. And, well, that's the thing is, so with that, I think that's every, more every, my... uh, every woman in that movie though, looks and feels like a hundred million times tougher than R- Linda Blair is in that movie. And she's, uh, I mean, she's, she's fine performance wise. I think casting, her is the tough one i don't see the metamorphosis the same way you do i i still I see did. it as funny throughout the whole thing i see i disagree i think she's i think she's a pure bass even the beginning like when she's it, they show her in the in the in the pe class and like you she's not afraid of the teacher she's like she's just a bad bitch but again i think there's like the, there's other girls in her group are also pretty like bad bitches but uh i don't know i, I have a soft spot i have a soft spot for linda blair anyways i just i find her she has her own appeal to me um you know but again you can also to say if you're really dissecting there's an element i mean there's that movie's all about the male gaze like yeah. at one point there's a very like unnecessary tub scene there is some female nudity that is unearned not that i guess you can say is female nudity ever earned, but uh, or nudity of any kind i mean i think i think it's a oh. that's a weird d- discussion but it but anyways, feels it's, more exploitive than some of the ones that were actually full-on exploitation films yeah exactly so but yeah it's totally exploitive now again i i'm I, you know i i i don't i Anyways, I, I have my own baser instincts and my own, like, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but again, even watching it now, it's like, well, that's, this scene is very unnecessary. And again, but it's what that would be a typical scene where some fucking armchair, uh, you know, fucking edgelord would say, see, it's about female empowerment because she's comfortable. Like, no, it's a fucking tub scene just to show Linda Blair's uh, big old boobies. But um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but I still love it. And I think when she gets her revenge at the end, it's fucking, I love it. And uh, I do, I think at the end, she's a bad motherfucker. Like, you know, she's taking on those dudes, um, not just with a sweet ass crossbow. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that's the script. I don't think that's her. Uh, not to say that the screenwriter was deprived of any yeah. awards either, but. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I, see, I, I mean. Maybe I'm being a little hard. I, I don't mean to be hard on Linda Blair. I, I think Linda Blair is, uh, it's always fun to see her in something. Uh, yeah. I, I think she's, she's in really... some movies I love that are terrible. Yeah. Uh, the movie Grotesque um, uh, is Roller a movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hell Night, which is filmed in our hometown. Yeah. But anyways, but yeah, so those that, you know, definitely that that's a subgenre. I think that, um, now, again, not for everybody, but it is very important if you're going to discuss revenge, because ultimately it's one of the most personal acts that you can have that you can find. I mean, everybody or most people, God forbid, I mean, or most people you would hope would uh, say is very understandably upsetting that you can be like root, root for somebody who's been as a victim of that crime. So it's so it's so easy. It's so such a, um, a kind of a cheap excuse to get revenge. But at the same time, we all like, you know, if you, if you were on the news and you hear like a lady was revenge and she fucking cut off the head of her fucking her attacker, most of us would be like, even if not publicly be like, hmm, good for her. Yeah, so, exactly. I, I think there would be a golf clap uh, around the world if yeah. you heard that story. And, and, you know, a big reason why these early revenge films were centered on rape I'm still convinced, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm still convinced one of the primary reasons is because there's no special effects. Uh, You want to show human drama, you want to show something horrible happen to somebody that would uh, allow us to cheer on the protagonist uh, performing decapitations and castrations and things like that. That's the easy one to go for. And I don't think that it's ever easy to have a rape scene in a movie in any era. But in a in a way, I do think that it was more difficult then than now to to get away with it and not be arrested at least. Yeah. Uh, so there was a certain level to which you could say they were making challenging and daring artistic choices. But I do still think that there's a a solid argument that a lot of them were just trying to like 
come up with a really inexpensive way to make a movie. And in fact, that's what a thriller, a cruel picture, or they call her one eye, which is my preferred title. Um, <laughs> that that guy just wanted to make something marketable. It was, it, what's it? Dutch. It's not an American Dutch, movie. Yeah. Dutch. This no, it's he, yeah. Dutch producer made a total flop, uh, made no money. And so his reaction was, well, I'm just going to make something that's completely 100% marketable garbage. And he chose to write Thriller, a cruel picture, which is probably one of the most difficult things I could conceive of ever marketing, ever. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, (laughs) uh, Which is about, uh, in this case, the the poor young girl. It's once again another uh, deaf mute woman. Uh, this this seems to be a recurring theme in this type of film, the the deaf mute thing. I, I don't know exactly why that got into the zeitgeist, but it did. Uh, but another deaf mute who she ends up being kidnapped and thrown into prostitution. So now she's she's part of a she's a, a sex slave, yeah. and she starts putting away. I don't I can't remember how she gets money. It's been a little while since I've seen Thriller. So basically, um, you know, the the uh, her pimp, if you want to call him that, the guy that kidnaps her and gets her hooked to heroin says like, you know, six days a week, you know, she has to fuck dudes. And then at the end of the week, you know, he, he'll, he'll, she'll get her, her heroin. And if she's a good girl, after a while, he'll start, she'll start getting like, you know, a small percentage of the money. So she finally like starts doing it. And then, you know, uh, she saves with a little, originally she's going to save the money so that she could get, go to rehab, but that doesn't work out. But yeah. Yeah. So she ends up learning how to uh, stunt drive a car. She learns Kung Fu. She learns shooting. Uh, it should also be pointed out that this uh, captor of hers, when she tried to escape the first time, she he gouged out her eye, which notoriously, the- yeah, it's one of the goriest things ever put in the film. And it was it was actually this is incredibly insensitive. I I, I may end up cutting this. I don't know, but it was they no, really. It's, I mean, it's real. They really yeah. carved. They cut the eye out of a uh, girl who had recently committed suicide to yep. get that. It's a scene. real cadaver. Which is fucking insane, yeah. but you know, uh, ah, fucking bad. yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, uh, she she trains and saves up, and and then she becomes you know a, a one man army and goes and kicks some ass, and she gets revenge not just against uh, her captor, but against her her regular clients, uh, quote unquote clients. Uh, one of whom looks exactly like, like I, I swear to God, I thought I was watching a member of ABBA be murdered for a sex crime. <laughs> Uh, the visual style, actually, I won't even give it that much. The visual style of the movie is rotten, uh, except for the, the, the fashion choice to give her eye patches that match whatever she's wearing that day. That is the reason why this movie stuck around. The, the, the acting is not great. The story is not particularly great. You could drive a Mack truck through the plot holes. It's a bad movie. (laughs) He, He straight up, the director straight up put moments of hardcore sex from like he hired porn workers who i think i think their names were actually adam and eve and they were known uh in dutch cinema uh for for this type of thing but he recorded close-ups of literally them their penetration and inserted them into the sex scenes with the uh quote-unquote clients which completely invalidates any kind of emotional rooting that i would do for the filmmaker himself in justifying making this movie i I was i i'd heard it was the distributor had did that to make it more but maybe i i think i think it was one and the same i i think this is i think the distributor was the director um okay it was it was added later it was not the actors in the film in this in the scene Uh, it is the most exploitive disgusting thing that you could possibly do is say you know what I don't think these rape scenes are enough or are sexy enough. I think we need actual sex in them. But it did give us the the image of the female assassin with one eye and the shotgun and uh that's why that movie's remembered. It's which is a great image and it was obviously carried over into Kill Bill by Ellie Driver, uh Daryl Hannah's character. But this is the one film on the list I only wanted to mention it just to say I don't like this movie. I, I will say this. I, I've actually never seen the cut with the hardcore penetration. I've only seen the, the edited version, the whatever they call the Avengers cut. Um, it is very sleazy. I mean, from the get-go. I mean, it's, it's that it was notoriously sleazy. I will say, like, 
Yeah, they, I mean, the acting is terrible. And it opens with, again, the rape of a minor. You know, that's why she's mute is because she's the victim of a, you know, it's a very, it's a very, I mean, it's. They, that's it, right. It got I forgot this, that she was a child when she. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The old creepy dude. But, um, you know, the thing is like, it's, it's, it, it got the subtitle a cruel picture um, once it was released to the States before then they, they called it uh, one eye, but um, it's very cruel. Like even the, the, the ladies, like her neighbors are fucking, it's just, it's a very ugly movie. I will say Ingrid. I forget the actress's name. I think she, I do think she has this weird like magnetism to herself, like yes. in that role. Like, and I will be a little bit more generous than you as far as I really do think. I think maybe because it's such a weird decision, but how every single action sequence is slowed down to the point where it's. I mean, it's insane. I was, like every I was action. irritated by that. The, there's a slow motion scene where she she hits a guy and and blood flies out in slow yeah. motion. And immediately I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Like, that's a good shot. The way that the blood arcs up yep. and out of his mouth. That's different. I've yep. never seen that before. And then he made me watch that same shot for about three or four minutes of just slow-mo beating this guy up. And every time I'm like, well, maybe there's another good hit. Nope, it's another hit with the blood flying in almost the exact same arc. I, yeah. I seriously, I was checking my watch, but I, I did start it off saying that was really cool. But I think the fact that it went on so long is why I didn't like it. But I, I think even like when, like even though like the like the special effects and they're nothing great, like when people get shot by a shotgun, it's like it's always you know, in the it's, same spot. She has perfect yeah. aim to shoot somebody square in the middle of the chest where chest. where the but again, there's like this, there's this squibs. I think with between the weird music and then like. I don't know. There's something weirdly compelling for me in those moments. Those are still the when I watch it. And I do think like the whole end sequence with the horse is really like, fucking, like that's unique. Um, <laughs> yeah, creative. Uh, okay. And again, like, you know, she's driving around in that cop car and like, at that point, it's not even revenge. These people are just innocent bystanders that she's running off the road. And, but again, you're like, it's, it's about her. Like she's just, she's, become like a killing machine but um it is trash and it is very like sleazy filmmaking but i I mean i do i can appreciate it because again you know there's there's a stylistic decision even like how she you know her eye patch has to match her that was cool i like uh, that like i don't know how she said there's visually eye patches to match her outfits uh, outfits in whatever like you said yeah like you said, plot holes you could drive a truck through. But uh, but again, I, I enjoy it. I think as a fan of genre filmmaking, I you know I give it its credit. But yeah, I mean it's not it's not like a fun watch, and it's not it's not a good movie. But I do think it's important because again, it was at that time. There's always going to be those films that really do sort of push the boundaries of what's acceptable. In fact, I the first time I saw it, I didn't even know there was hardcore penetration in the original. That wasn't something I learned until years later. And I was like, what the fuck, really? And then come to find out that's actually been done in a few movies where they did like, they're, um, I'm blanking on the name of it now. Um, it's actually a few titles, but there's this, it was a, a movie about this like deranged ex-vet. He came from back from Vietnam and he just basically starts murdering and, and killing and raping women. I didn't realize when it was released, it was released as a porno, like uh. with full on full penetration and i was like what so i mean there's i mean there's there's definitely a sleazy element to uh some of these kind of films but you know thankfully it's not all filmmaking just to kind of sum it up in in the best i can i feel like there is nothing that you can get from they call her one eye that isn't better done in ms 45 yeah well i think ms 45 is definitely um but i'm not sure ms 45 is a revenge film i'm gonna say that (laughs) I don't know, man. It's, I mean, she's, she's raped twice and starts killing dudes. So, you know, I've heard it as I've actually read this article saying it's the worst filmatic misandry of any film in history. I'm like, did, are you saying that? I, I, I don't know. I've heard some, I've read some articles not, and not by like dipshits in their, you know, uh, their little fucking WordPress blogs. But I mean, I've read like film, you know, discussion about how that movie is gross because it, I, I don't know. Either way, I do like Miss 45. It's like a weird, it's like an art house version of a rape revenge film. I do. Um, I like Miss 45. But I, yeah, I, I, but I, I do like enjoy it. it. Yeah. Uh, it, that one's directed by Abel Ferreira, who we yeah. brought up uh, in our Willem Dafoe discussion because he's still working today. Abel and Ferreira's does a lot of stuff. Thing. Yeah, does a lot of stuff with Willem Dafoe. This was his second or third movie he this was the first movie that i've seen of his where he kind of found his polish because yeah. uh, his first movie was driller killer and i i enjoy driller killer immensely but it it looks and feels about as solid as a movie called driller killer can 
Uh, Ms. 45, on the other hand, does actually kind of approach an art house sort of take on this. There's elements of taxi driver in it, elements of all sorts of things. Uh, and, and it's also, it's it's frequently misspelled. It's not ms.45, uh, as in the, you know, th- there is no period on Ms. like there is on Mr. It's like 45, like the 45 millimeter. It, yes, it's for, exactly. Yeah, 45 caliber. It's Ms.45. Uh, it, you'll find it on, on cable guides and stuff still frequently. They'll call it ms.45. Uh, but it's a fascinating film, and it was uh, the the woman who who plays the lead. I'm losing her name right now, but uh, she she had a rather tragic life too. She's only 17 when she does Miss 45. Uh, which oh, calls, is she? I thought I didn't know that. It calls Zoe other Lund. things into question. Zoe Lund, yes, uh, calls yeah. other things into question in terms of that. Although she did continue to work with Abel Ferreira well into her adulthood, and uh, she was actually a co writer on. Bad Lieutenant, the original Bad Lieutenant that Abel Ferrer directed with Harvey Keitel. So she went on to become a screenwriter. Uh, but she she was addicted to heroin in real life. And she wasn't just addicted to heroin like it was her personal shame. She was addicted to heroin the way that uh, Woody Harrelson likes to smoke weed. Like, <laughs> like she was a proponent for it. She thought everybody should be taking heroin. And she spoke loudly and clearly on, you know, more people should be doing this. Why aren't more people doing this? And she was able to function. She wrote a friggin' classic movie with uh, Abel Ferreira on it. Uh, and then she she traveled to France. She could not get her hands on heroin, so she switched to cocaine and died of a drug overdose. It's a tragic tale, but there is a certain element. Like, had she had access to the heroin, would the heroin have kept her going? Because it wasn't the heroin uh, that killed her. It, they, um, I, directly, anyways. Uh, and I don't mean to laugh at her story. I bring it up because it's interesting, and I love the, the backstories behind these movies. But with Ms. 45, I do think that there's a question of whether or not it is a revenge movie at all. I, I actually side on it being a vigilante movie because she is, she's another deaf mute. As I said, this happens a lot yeah. in, in, in this subgenre of the subgenre of the subgenre. And uh, she ends up, she, she's raped twice in the same day by two separate incidences that are completely unrelated. Uh, and the first guy gets away and the second guy, she kills in the act. So yep. she goes to the, the police right then having already gotten her actual revenge and killed her rapist, there's no way, there's nobody that puts her in jail. There's no no way that she uh, suffers any kind of punishment for her reaction to this. And in fact, the only thing that could happen additionally is that maybe the cops would go after the first motherfucker that raped her. Uh, but instead, she snaps. She's already yeah. committed her revenge, and every person that she kills after that is vigilante justice. That's true. That's and true. there's that word justice again. And even then, I think, I don't know how much of this Abel Ferreira meant uh, as a statement when it first came out, but you can also interpret this as she's just going after men. She's going after skeevy men, but not every man that she kills is implicitly right. trying to rape her. They're, they're objectifying her. Every single one of them that she kills has objectified her in some way. Uh, but one guy kills himself because he's not trying to come on to her. She thinks he is, and she goes to kill him, and the, and the gun jams. And so he takes the gun, fixes it, and kills himself for her uh, because he's just a sad sack going through a divorce or whatever uh, and yeah. followed her around from the bar, and she thinks that he has uh, bad intentions. So there's a lot in question in terms of the revenge element of Ms. 45. What do, you, what do you think? No, in fact, that's true. You know, the thing is, like, you know, I think maybe and that's I kind of goes into where, like, there are not, you know, not a lot, but a few people out there who consider the film to be uh, misandrous because it does sort of, it's almost justifying that, like, you know, all these these killings of these guys, whether they're actual, you know, perpetrators or not, you know, it's arguing that the film is justified. The, she's lost her mind at that point. Like she is, like you said, she's, she snapped. So uh, I don't think it's glorifying anything. I think what it's saying though, is that women, the message I would take away from it. And, uh, or at least I did originally was that women every day have to be afraid of their safety and that they don't, you, it's almost impossible to tell a, a good guy from a bad guy. And, uh, you know, and it's ba- basically saying like, it's making a statement about, you know, the inherent danger of being a woman and of having to constantly be afraid of like the male attacker. And, you know, you're, uh, you're exactly right, too, because like I said, she's a deaf mute. And this guy who kills himself for her, um, the whole time he's speaking to her, he's talking about how he found his wife with another woman. 
Um, and he doesn't know if she's coming home. And so he killed her cat, which I think was kind of ridiculous. But at the end of the day, I think we can all agree. Okay. You killed the cat instead of your girlfriend, probably the better call, but not the best call, but yeah, (laughs) but she can't hear that. He's following her around complaining about his life. She thinks that he's following him around because he's skeevy. Exactly. And he's actually not, well, he could be, but he's not in this instance. But I think you're, I, I think that, uh, her character is Ms. 45. She exists in the same world as Travis Bickle in my mind, which uh, Taxi Driver is another one. I do not consider Taxi Driver to be a revenge film or a vigilante film. It is a character study of psychosis and PTSD. And I think Ms. 45 fits right into that same space where it is not really definable by any other genre. And it's kind of what makes it so special and unique. And the final shootout, uh, which is very... Carrie-esque, very reminiscent of Brian De Palma's Carrie in a way, uh, where she is dressed in a, as a nun in a Halloween nun. party and just starts blowing dudes away. It's very effective and very beautifully shot. So if you ever get a chance, Abel Ferrer's Ms. 45, not an easy movie to watch, but a rewarding movie to watch. But I'm going to stand firm, not a revenge movie. So, I will say this, though, and you can talk about this in film in general, but one thing that I, always, I have found interesting is in real life, r- rape is not a sexual crime. I mean, women of all shapes, sizes, and ages get raped. In the majority of rape cases, it's not about sexual sexual attraction. It's about power. But in a lot of these movies, whether it's Monica Bellucci and Irreversible or, you know, uh, Zoe Lund in Miss 45 or Camille Keaton in I Spit in Your Grave, like these are very attractive young women. And there's definitely an element of like, look how pretty, how beautiful this woman is. And they, you know, there's, not necessarily so much maybe uh in all of them but i do feel like a lot of these films there's a, there is a little bit of a je- objectification even amongst the film itself with the actress i mean in i spin your grave there's a lot of nudity um you know obviously uh irreversible you know it's focusing on i mean how do you not i mean michael is one of the most beautiful women in the world but like there's just all these kind of and i'm always a little like skeeved by that in, in itself because it's like you know that's not you know, it's almost like it's as exploit. It's about as real life exploitation as you can get. Is of like you know making the statement about how awful rape is, but at the same time you are basically objectifying <laughs> your female actress that she's focusing on her physical beauty, about her age and stuff. Because a lot of these, it's like you said, I didn't know uh, Zoe Lynn was only seventeen when she made it, but that even that like in itself is a little like uh, yeah bizarre. But anyways, let's not go too much into. Uh, I will say though that one movie though I have to talk about because it is. It is also a rape revenge, but it's so different and so much more than that is Lady Snowblood, yes. which has the simple premise is the most, this lady <laughs> has a child just to get revenge. She's gonna, she gives birth, she gets pregnant, she's raped, um, and uh, basically tricks the prison guard at the prison she's in to fuck her so that she can have give birth to a daughter that she can raise to be a vehicle for revenge. Like that's the because craziest she can't get revenge herself. Yeah. Herself. Exactly. So that's the, that's the most revenge based storyline ever. You don't get more revenge than that. Like someone <laughs> whose whole existence is to be revenge, but I mean, a great movie, a beautiful movie. One of the most, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, Criterion's put that out along with the sequel. Uh, I need the, I need, in fact, I was picking up all these Criterion movies recently, but I kept putting, I was like, I, I, I'll, I'll come back to Lady Snowblood. And then the Criterion sale ended. So I kicked myself in the ass. And then There's still available a bunch on the channel things. though. That's where I, I haven't seen the sequel in ages and I hadn't seen the original in ages either, but I did rewatch about half of the original on the Criterion channel recently uh, to kind of brush up on this. And, uh, and to remind myself, cause I don't think I had seen it since I'd seen Kill Bill, which was, uh, no, I had to have, I, you know what? It's this is a little bit chicken in the egg. I think there's no way I would have known about Lady Snowblood before Kill Bill, uh, but right around the same time, and it still holds up. It's a beautiful movie. The blood is perfect, sort of uh, samurai swordplay blood, where it's it's geysers. Right. Um, yep. The story is absolutely ridiculous, but you you go with it. It's the uh, the mother is traveling with her husband and they're assaulted and um, he's killed. Yep. And then she gets, isn't it that she, uh, she gets revenge or she, she does something to get herself arrested, but that's why she's in prison as well. Or yeah, so I, uh, But it's political reasons. Exactly. Yes. And so, yeah. So um, she's basically gang raped. Uh, yeah. 
uh, gang attacked. And so um, she's in prison and she, that's literally like she, all, her, all she wants is to get revenge. So she ends up basically um, seducing a prison guard to basically fuck her just they imply that she has seduced several men within that prison don't they yeah, yeah I, they, I, they, they basically are slut shaming her and then when she's having her baby she's explaining to them why like she accepts she says yes, yes i have been a slut basically uh yeah. not that i agree with the stance <laughs> in the context of the movie but she's saying it like yes, she's I, like yes I, I don't give a fuck Be- call me whatever yeah. you want i'm doing this because i want a child who is going to exact revenge for my husband in a way that I cannot. Exactly. And that's the thing is, and um, like I said, it's such a, (laughs) only, only the Japanese could come up with something so kind of, I don't know, fantastical, uh, but it's, you know, the film itself is like a very fucking weird, dark fairy tale. And it's almost feels um, like a ghost story. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good, I would never have thought that, but I think you're actually pretty dead on with that, but yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's, Visually, it was very, I mean, it's beautifully shot. Like, uh, there's, there, if you've seen uh, Kill Bill and the Oren Ishii, like, segment, like, as brilliant as, you know, Tarantino is at, at v- a visual style, like, he doesn't get those ideas out of nowhere. And if you see Lady Snowblood, you'll get that reference. But um, another, uh, we've been having this conversation for over an hour now, and I think we've only really we touched really? the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Holy crap. Um, <laughs> okay. what, to, keep, to keep it in, though, in Asia, there are two more modern revenge films that I think are really important um, that I just really quickly want to talk about, and I won't go into all of them. Um, the first is obviously uh, the very uh, well-known, well-respected Park Chan-wook's Vengeance trilogy, yes. um, which started with uh, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, Old Boy, and then Lady Vengeance, a.k.a. Sympathy for Lady Vengeance. All three are great films. I think Old Boy o- overshadows the other two in the trilogy, rightfully so, because it is more. It's just such a fucking uh, crazy roller coaster ride of a movie, <laughs> but everything about it works. I mean, it's just it's its own thing. Um, I've never read the manga; it's based off of the other two films in the Vengeance trilogy are, are original stories written and created by Park Chan Wook. But uh, Old Boy is based off of a manga. But it's one of those rare cases where, like, I don't even give a fuck about the source material because I guarantee you, most of the things I enjoy about the film itself has nothing to do with the manga. It's it's just such an insane. It's so high concept, and yet it works so perfectly because of the amazing visual style and the casting. And you know, it's just a—it's such an incredible film. You know, everybody talks about the you know the twist to it, but that's like all they seem to talk about. But I'm like, the twist is just one element of an insane, really rewarding viewing. Like, yeah, yeah. it's part of the overall story, but to me, it's like it's not the first thing I think about. It's yes. It is the crux of like the villain's revenge. Uh, I don't know if we want to give spoilers away on this. But, I, I don't um, want to spoil either. Old Boy because I really want to encourage people to see it. Yeah. Um, I, I will say this for the twist though. The twist hits you in the gut and, and it is, you don't see it coming and it's absolutely crazy. Yes. Yes. I don't think though that the twist itself is more interesting than the mystery itself. Uh, the mystery of trying, trying to unpeel like how, who the hell held him captive? For those who don't know, I, I, I'll do this as spoiler-free as possible. Uh, this guy is abducted from everyday life out of nowhere. Has no idea who he would have that would be an enemy. No idea what kind of crimes he might have committed. Basically, a completely innocent person. Although we don't start with him seeing him. We see him belligerently drunk. But, yeah. but that's, Missing his, his four-year-old daughter's birthday. Yes, because he's belligerently yeah. drunk. So we, we drunk, get the yeah. idea that maybe he has some some blind spots as to how yep. pure of a person he really is. But nonetheless, uh, generally law-abiding, not someone deserving of what he must suffer. He's just suddenly abducted and kept in a small sort of studio apartment with a fake window looking out on a fake sunlight. He has a TV and a shower and a bed and... Uh, it's basically like being held in a hotel room and he, nobody's telling him what he's done. Nobody's telling him when they're going to let him out. And the whole ordeal takes about 15 years. Uh, And he's starting to finally piece together how he's going to break out on his own. When after 15 years, he wakes up in a, basically a crate or suitcase uh, on top of a building in the middle of the city. And he doesn't know what to do. And he starts to get help. He, like 
he doesn't seek out help. Help starts to appear for him, like in the form of new clothes and a cell phone and uh, yeah. thing, you know, money to get him through the day to day. But but the help that he's receiving comes with like continuing taunts to where it's it's fairly obvious that the person that held him captive for 15 years is also giving him the help, uh, yeah. which... Uh, and I, I left out a major part in, in the meantime, he finds out by watching TV in his room towards the beginning that his wife and his child have been murdered and that his disappearance is implicating him as the murderer. Uh, so when he gets out, he's a fugitive. Yep. And so it really does become a question of like, was it better to be held captive in the security of that cage uh, that seemed to have other uh, comforts of, of living in it? It wasn't like a jail cell versus being alive and free and, and out, but unable to go anywhere, unable to see anybody, unable to let anyone know that you exist because you're a wanted criminal at that point for, for basically the most vile possible act of, of killing your own family, including your uh, four-year-old daughter. And he, uh, he starts to crack. And of course he does what <laughs> I guess you could say any of us would do, which is try to figure out who set him up yep. and go over his list of enemies. And, and it's, it's absolutely intriguing. Every moment of it is visually beautiful, perfectly acted. No matter how hard the crime against him has been, you never get kind of the, the revenge feel that, that you would get in some of these other movies we've discussed. Like this movie doesn't have the same hanky feeling. It has its own set of yeah. hanky feelings, uh, which yes. I won't go into, but, uh, but you are so wrapped up in the mystery of, of what's going on uh, that you don't feel like you were exploiting anything and seeing this. You're really just diving headfirst into a really expert storytelling session. Yeah. And that's the thing is it's whole, I mean, it's, it's as wholly unique of a film because in one part, it's part, uh, there's an action movie element to it that, mm -hmm. you know, it, that when it turns into an action film, it's very memorable. I'll leave it at that. Some people have called it a neo-noir, which I can fully see. Like, I, see a lot it. I don't of, know if I agree with it, but I see it. But again, it's 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 from a South Korean perspective and stuff. But uh, yeah. But when you think about the actual story elements, the and, and how theatrical some of the actual plot points are, you can sort of see where it does really kind of have some. You know, there are some uh, similarities to some of the plot points in some. You know classic noir films like the uh the, the stretch the leaps of anyways you have to see yeah. the movie for to understand <laughs> what i'm saying but but yeah it's a great movie but the whole vengeance trilogy is worth it too i feel like old boy outshines him because it is so much more unique where um lady vengeance and simply for mr vengeance well also still really in themselves have really unique takes on the the revenge you know fantasy kind of film um they're not as they're not as unique as old boy but another f korean film i feel like about revenge which i think is to me one of the most important movies about revenge i think ever made and about what it says about revenge is i saw the devil oh, and i haven't seen this one it's one of the most visceral films I, I think i've ever seen it is a little long and it it keeps its unrelenting pace of where it goes at its and its runtime is a little excessive to the point where you're by the time you get your get to the end of the film you're literally mentally and physically exhausted but it's basically it's about a cop trying to find i'm not I, again no spoilers for it but it's a cop who uh is trying to find a killer it is personal and but he doesn't know who the killer is but he goes to links he basically stops being a cop uh and starts doing some fucking crazy shit to find the killer and I will say that the ending of the movie, uh, the one spoiler I will say is, yes, there is some, some, some amount of revenge and vengeance has been served. But the, what the film is saying is at the end of the movie, the cops, this guy, first off, has sold his, essentially sold all of his humanity the, for the sake of vengeance. At the end, of the, at the end it's, he's no happier. He's, he's not better for it. And mm -hmm. he, is, he has lost all of his humanity and it, does, it hasn't made him whole. And it's a very, it's a powerful ending. And I think it's a thing that it's too much of a bummer for Western audiences. It's like, we want to see fucking, you know, Paul Kersey, you know, uh, walk away with like, you know, uh, with a wink and, you know, no, that's not this movie. It's, it is, it's saying like, first of violence in itself is unrewarding. Violence of any kind is, should never be the answer to a problem. And especially if you lower yourself to the, to the levels of a mo like, you should you you should definitely watch the film because there's a lot of things I want to say about it, but I don't. I, it's a lot of the film is in the watching and the where it, the places that it will go. But 
it's such a powerful statement. It's not something that you see very common in, in cinema where, yeah, you, you're there and you see these awful characters and the more it goes on, you know, this char- character and I, this, this guy might not be the same killer, but he's a piece of shit too. But, oh, damn, like that's, he, he's, this dude is, uh, this dude's, this dude's turning into the monster he's trying to hunt. We'll just say that. Well, that's, um, that calls into question, I haven't seen this, but I, and I'm also looking for a, a, a quick segue here. <laughs> uh, be, be, because i see one because i see one uh okay. <laughs> I, that calls to question whether or not vengeance can truly be achieved from a law enforcement perspective my feeling is that not every vigilante movie is a revenge movie but every revenge movie is a vigilante movie S- because i don't feel like you can have the law at your back and and yeah. if if you're investigating something that it's not personal enough that it happened to you there are ways obviously there are exceptions in which the investigation of something can lead to the catastrophic event like uh, someone could be doing revenge against you and then you get revenge against them that is outside of your badge but i i I feel like a, a police officer really can't get revenge cinematically speaking because they have the backing of the system and and in but the i will say run, though real quick just to cut to cut you off real quick i will say uh and i saw the devil uh he this is not he this is a he leaves being a police officer behind as i think he's actually a secret agent i don't even know if he's really a cop i think he's like right but anyways but yeah and he he yeah, he, this is, it would definitely be more of a, like, he takes the law into his own hand kind of vigilante aspect of it. But I agree with you. I think the same thing. Like, it's, there's a difference between a cop bending the laws or breaking the laws and then jo- Joe or John Public taking the law into his own hand. I think, in fact, inherently in a revenge film or a vigilante film, it has to be a man taking the law into his own hand because the law's not, isn't going to work for him kind of thing. Yeah. And sometimes the law has been tried and sometimes the, the law is not even mentioned as a potential solution. But a lot of times correct, the revenge comes from the impotence of the law to help yeah. in the first place. But that does bring me to a couple of questions. Uh, <laughs> is it a revenge film? Uh, because I don't think that my law enforcement rule is a rule so much as a guidepost. Uh, because I absolutely believe you uh, that the one, uh, what, what's it called again? I saw the devil. Uh, that I saw the devil is a revenge film, but is RoboCop a revenge film? Because it has a lot of the elements of a revenge film, but it's not real. Like I, I don't know. What do you think? Because it, it had, like I said, it's uh, it's definitely revenge as an element of it, but it, 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 <laughs> RoboCop's its own. It's a <laughs> God bless. <laughs> we could talk. Let's have an episode where we talk just about <laughs> RoboCop. But I mean, yeah, revenge is definitely there's an aspect of revenge, and, and goddamn, when the revenge is had, it's oh so sweet. But uh. Yeah, it's too complicated to be a traditional revenge. Yes. Okay. I, I agree with you on that. But I, I did have to stop and think because it, it did pop into my head. He does get some pretty gnarly ev- revenge against Clarence Boddicker and, and, uh, and the people who made him RoboCop. And that's what made me think maybe it is revenge because he does get revenge against the people who made him RoboCop aside from the people that killed him as a human as Murphy. Yep. But those people were also breaking the law when they were making him RoboCop. So and and it's not like they're going to throw RoboCop in jail at the end of the movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but it has it has <laughs> the stink of revenge is all over it. Uh another one uh there's a whole subsection of revenge movies in which the revenge is not being exacted by innocent people. These are there's a whole criminal revenge subgenre yeah, revenge. Subgenre. Yep. Yes. Uh, and these would be things like uh Michael Caine and Get Carter. Um, uh, Mel yep. Gibson in Payback, Payback, uh, Lee yep. Marvin in Point Blank. Uh, yep. Some of these are are some of the best movies ever made. The, they're often very stylish. They usually have a good thumping soundtrack to them. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes the revenge can be committed by bad guys. And in fact, the, I think the tagline on the poster for Payback with Mel Gibson was "Prepare to root for the bad guy." Yeah. But what about situations like Cape Fear? Cape Fear, there is nothing in Cape Fear that is not centered around vengeance, but it's from the perspective of the person whose the vengeance is being visited upon. And technically speaking, he deserves that vengeance because he, for those who don't know Cape Fear, either the original uh, by J. Lee Thompson uh, in the 60s, uh, who went on to direct some of the Death Wish movies uh, starring 
Robert Mitchum and Gregory Peck. Uh, and then there was, of course, a uh, 1991 remake with Nick Nolte and Robert De Niro, directed by Martin Wait, Scorsese. Scorsese. Uh, both of which I have equal love for, and I actually think uh, of all remakes, that one actually makes an interesting double feature. Yeah, I agree. Very rare case where like they're, I feel like they're equal footing. Yeah, Scorsese takes it into slightly different territory, but really it's only in the characterizations and not in the storytelling itself. And in that story... Uh, the main character, let's just go with the original here. We've got Robert Mitchum is the antagonist and Gregory Peck is the protagonist. And Gregory Peck is an attorney who in his early days represented Mitchum uh, in a case that was uh, about uh, sexual assault. And Peck knew that Mitchum was guilty, but it was his job to represent him in court. But a new piece of evidence comes to light that would get Max K- uh, Robert Mitchum's character, Max Katie, off on the sexual assault. And now I can't remember if this was an eyewitness sort of a thing or whether this was a technicality sort of a thing. Uh, But one way or another, Gregory Peck's character ends up holding back that evidence so that Robert Mitchum will go to prison. And when Robert Mitchum goes to prison, he is a brutal, disgusting serial rapist without a brain in his head. When he comes out of prison, he's learned how to read. He learned how to read by reading nothing but law books in the Bible and comes back with vengeance on his mind. But the smoothest talker, like the, just, oh, he's so skeevy. Through the entire movie, he's exacting revenge on Gregory Peck and his family because he's grown older and has a family now with a teenage daughter. And the whole movie's about the revenge. It really is. There's no other discernible plot point. There's In the Scorsese version, there's some infidelity uh, between him and his, and his wife. But that's really subplot to the revenge yeah. itself. So yeah. is Cape Fear a revenge film flipped from another perspective? See, it's funny because... I was literally going to bring up this exact topic. Um, I don't know. I mean, yes, in the the most, uh, like, technical way, because that is the plot, but uh, I don't know. I mean, first off, crime revenge films are, like I said, its own subgenre anyways, because they're usually a little bit more complicated. Because I think there's this level of innocence that has to be had, in my mind anyways, to be a true revenge film. Like, it has to be somebody who is a victim. Not that you can't be a criminal and have be also be a victim. In fact, you know, that literally is the uh, the plot of every single film that you just, uh, the ones that you mentioned. But something like Keep Fear is, is really unique because it is a criminal getting revenge. And for that reason, I would say, well, yeah, I mean, I guess technically it is a revenge film. It, it doesn't come to mind and I don't watch it. To, I guess the thing that separates it for me personally in my own definition is I watch, there is an element of vicarious, I'm watching a revenge film and sort of living vicariously through the person who is a victim getting their revenge. I'm not doing that with Cape Fear. Uh, yeah. But uh, but but yeah, technically it is a revenge film. It is the whole modus operandi of Max Cady and, uh, in both versions. And yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, I saw that, you know, and I was like, you know, I wonder if Devin's going to talk about that. And, you know, and <laughs> sure enough. So, but yeah, it's a very interesting uh, conversation. I don't put, I will, I will never listen to it, even though I love both versions. In fact, I think the De Niro or the, uh, I mean, De Niro's performance, but the uh, Scorsese one has moments in that shit that really unnerve me and really kind of creep me out. But um, yeah, I can't look at a flare without thinking about Cape Fear. (laughs) Right, exactly. Same, same. But yeah, for me, I'll never put on my list of like, you know, most enjoyable revenge films because it's just not what that is to me. But it's a great movie and it's about revenge. So I guess it's kind of like uh, 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 splitting hairs at this point. But yeah, it's a... uh, Interesting, interesting uh, conversation. And then uh, similarly, one one more, uh, just for this one's almost more for shits and giggles. Uh, it's like when we did uh, werewolf movies, everybody knows what a werewolf movies, but uh, it's but revenge <laughs> movies. It's a little uh, less than black and white. But uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan has popped up on a lot of lists of revenge movies. And I see where they're coming from. But personally, I don't see it as a revenge movie. It, it, well, first off, in a weird revenge. way, in a weird way, it's also because obviously there's a that revenge goes both ways in that movie, anyways. Because yes, you know, just like you know Max Cady, like uh, Khan is getting his own revenge, like for being like left on that planet. And, but I mean, Khan. I mean, it is, it is, <laughs> but it's also a Star Trek movie that has other things going on to it. But I think I also saw that on some lists of uh, revenge films. I was like, what? But you know, I guess it makes sense. 
but uh, I again, no, it's not a revenge film, not to my eyes, but it is a revenge based uh, Star Trek film, and obviously with anybody who knows a goddamn thing, the best of the original. Uh, and and I I am one of the people on Earth uh, who actually really enjoys the original, the Star Trek the motion picture, uh, despite it being a two hour snooze fest. I still like. I think it's the movie looks amazing. I like all the performances. In fact, I still think it's probably for that original cast, it's the best performance they all did together. Like, but yeah, I mean, most people shit all over it, but I enjoy it. But yeah, obviously, Wrath of Khan is the fun. Uh, it's the most fun of the original the original series films. But yeah, interesting. I, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's a revenge film, but I mean. Yeah, it's. I think it goes along with Cape Fear. I think if Cape hmm. Fear is not a revenge film, then Wrath of Khan is. Is Batman a revenge film? Because, you know. No, it is. Batman was the one that, to me, that's how I disqualified Death Wish. Even though I think Death Wish could almost become honorable mention uh, in a revenge film conversation. Uh, and certainly Death Wish 2 and 3, he's specifically going after the the creeps who hurt his family and friends. Yeah. But in the first one, he doesn't know who who ki- who murdered his wife and raped his daughter. And yeah. so he's just kind of going after all of them. And there is a Batman element to it. It's literally New York City in the 70s. And, you- and I think that that goes into vigilantism and not revenge because... You never see Paul Kersey actually exact revenge on the people who destroyed his family and, and yeah, changed original, his life. Yep. Uh, that's true. And that's funny because that, that, it's funny because we talked about seeking justice, that. not revenge. Yep, exactly. Correct. Or he, he's still seeking vengeance because taking the law into your own hand isn't true justice, even though you won the, the vigilante himself might argue that point, like by what you can't have justice without law. And then that is breaking the, there's a whole, well, well, it is justice and it's a different kind of, the same way that there's so many different interpretations of the truth, but facts are more important than truths. Truth. Yeah, Uh, exactly. But most people think they're the same thing. But I do think we need to revisit justice. I agree with you. And I think we do need to, I mean, I would love to revisit this conversation and specifically focus on the kind of, you know, man taking the law or woman. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of great female, I mean, Miss 45 being kind of one of them, but there is some really great, uh, you know, not even, I mean, doesn't even have to be great. There's just some very like, whether it's, you know, uh, that new, that Peppermint movie. There's been a lot of, over the years, the one with, uh, uh, was it The Survivor? The one with Jodie Foster. But there's been some really the brave interesting, one, like, I think was that one. Yeah, the brave one, exactly. So there's been some really interesting, you know, female vigilante films that um, I think I should probably revisit. I've never seen that Peppermint. It did look a little too. I watched half of Pe- Peppermint to, to do this podcast and I had to get, a, I had a phone call and, and had to go an appointment that I had got pushed forward an hour so i had to take it off pause and go and deal with the appointment and i think if i had liked the movie more i would have gone back and finished it uh it added nothing new to the conversation in my in my mind there are a couple of uh we'll come back to this in a minute because there are a couple of more modern examples of revenge films that i think are worthy of note but i will say this about peppermint it just it provides nothing new to the genre and I'm not a huge fan of Jennifer Garner to begin with. Sure, her performance Me tends neither. to get the only good reviews in the whole thing. Where people say, "Well, it's a bad movie," but Jennifer Garner was great. I don't even give it that. I don't really like Jennifer Garner very much. I do, Devin. Sometimes you and I are so on the same page; it's scary, especially when <laughs> I find Jennifer Garner like almost unwatchable. I find yeah. there's some something about her that does not. Uh... I will be interested in a plot until I hear that she's involved, and and nothing against her. I don't know very much about her as a human being. Yeah, at it's all. not personal. I just don't uh, it's find just her... as soon as I hear that she's in something, I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Well, yeah. I got other stuff to watch. Um, yeah. <laughs> now that I sound like I'm being mean towards her, uh, yeah. but but uh, just being honest with with this film, it tries really hard to be super cool. Um, it tries to pretend like it's directed by Tony Scott or something. Exactly. Um, and and comes off like trying to pretend like it was directed by Tony Scott. Like that's it. It feels phony all the way through. And there are some, some big are, actors so who you take mean, on these revenge movies, uh, these modern revenge movies. And I have no problem sinking into their performance and believing that they are this person. Uh, but the idea that Jennifer Garner disappears for five years and, and pops up as a MMA quality fighter, um, I'm willing to believe that on a low budget level. It's kind of the same way I feel about the Fast and the Furious movies. I can't criticize them on a story structure level because I like stuff that's much dumber than those movies and sincerely like and praise stuff that's much dumber than those movies. But the ones that I praise tend to be about a 10th of the cost. Yeah. Uh, If you're going to have the budget of peppermint or the budget of fast and the furious, have a fucking brain 
and let me have fun yeah. with the low budget stuff because the low budget stuff needs the advantage of the fantasy in order yeah, to make the low the budget stuff creative. work and don't make me believe that, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we are so on the exact same page. I will say this though, just to get some extra snark in it, because you were saying about how it's pretending to be a, a, a Tony Scott film and stuff. And I was like, oh, you mean kind of like a, a modern Tony Scott film? Uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, um, oh, hey, oh. But uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is like, there's so many great revenge films. Uh, I feel like this is definitely a topic we can revisit anytime because there's a hundred films I, I didn't even get the chance to bring up. One, you haven't one even of, mentioned my favorites yet. Well, let's let's well let's do this. Let's I'll say the, the my piece on event. We should we'll definitely have to revisit because like I said, there most vigilante films start with revenge. I mean, at the heart of every vigilante movie, it's revenge because they are not doing what they're doing. Nobody, unless you're a fucking true psychopath, you don't turn into like a Punisher type character unless you've suffered personal tragedy. Uh, you don't just like you know you don't live a a, 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 a if if you've lived a, a a you know a blessed you know existence if you have a, if you have no problems and you pick up a gun and you start killing people uh, that means you're a murderer you're just a mass murderer but well, um it's it's like what i said before where a revenge movie doesn't have an and then yeah the person commits revenge movie's yes. over uh, i vigilante movies frequently are the and then yeah they, they yeah well then that's the thing is and i think i mean well it did, i think it does like a movie like you know eye of the tiger which is an interesting movie <laughs> or something like even walk tall there's not even really like in walk tall there's really no v- revenge it's literally just this guy sees crime and people getting away with shit and he just decides to Pick stand up for a little guy stick. and i think that's yeah. its own thing but something like you said something like uh death wish where it's like people he loves suffer from this awful thing and he decides to take the one in his own hand i think is like it's obviously it starts from like a revenge film type of premise but then it becomes its own thing but uh but again i think that topic alone i think like because i think there's also just been some amazing films in that subgenre of the vigilante ones that i and when i buy vigilante i don't mean batman i don't mean the punisher i don't mean a right. comic book vigilante i mean much more grounded realistic you know just man like i said i keep saying it but like man who takes the you know takes law into his own hand i mean fucking that's like you know a ton of uh 80s action films sort of have that same uh plot point but anyways uh what were some of the other films before we wrap up that you wanted to mention before we uh and again we can definitely revisit this in a part i, two I think i think we should do a part two because there's just too much i want to say about some of these other ones because we haven't done well i'm not going to say what we haven't done because i want to right. hold it over uh well, good. You I, you know, what, what but i because it springs boards off of what you just said and because it, it springs a little bit off of something I, I teased earlier. One, one last film that I'll put out there that I don't think we'll have a long discussion about, but just to say that there is sometimes an acceptable superhero level of revenge movie. Uh, I, I struggled with whether I was going to put The Punisher on, on this list and, and ultimately decided that The Punisher really is more of a vigilante story the way it continues. Yes. But uh, it's not based on a comic book, which is kind of part of why I decided that it qualifies in my mind. I think Darkman is a a revenge film. Uh, And that is my Liam Neeson revenge film for the evening. I I think uh, in the original Darkman, he's not a normal guy. He's a scientist, a a genius scientist who's coming up with a skin replicating uh, machine. Uh, that's going to revolutionize uh, trauma recovery, ironically. Uh, and he's murdered because of something that happens involving his girlfriend and her investigation of a, of a particular company and a particular man within that company. And he spends the rest of the movie trying to get his face back together. He's horribly scarred and he tries to get his invention back together so that he can create his old face again and try to bring back his life. Uh, but he's also mapping out and executing very elaborate brutal revenge against the henchmen in this guy's gang and he doesn't go after anybody who's not connected to his own uh figurative death uh because he is left for dead he he's only going after this one person and you get the feeling towards the end uh spoiler alert dark man lives and goes on with a different face which happens to be bruce campbell's uh who who was supposed to be dark man in the first place uh before the studio went with liam neeson but you don't get the idea necessarily that he's gone off to become batman you get the idea that he's gone off to just exist yeah to to try to be something else so i don't think there's any vigilanteism aside from the revenge in dark man and then i never saw the sequels 
but I do know about the sequels that he's consistently going after the gangster Durant who is the gangster who was uh, at least partly responsible for his disfigurement and figurative murder. So in a way, even it seems that even in the continuing adventures that he's going after the people that initially wronged him, which is again, more of a revenge than a vigilante. What, what do you think? Do you, do you, do you think of Dark Man as a revenge movie? That's it, about as I comic mean, book I, as I could get with it. Yeah. I mean, it's such, it's like, if you say that's a revenge film, is like Dr. Fibes a revenge film? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I although, contemplated that. And yes, I do. I think yeah. that Dr. Fibes is a revenge film. And so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's uh, you know, God, the Dark Man is such a unique movie. And I think that's one, because, you know, even though, again, it was sort of, it was sort of, um, marketed as this sort of like like almost like superhero because he has that like the ability to change his face but you know it's like and he has man in his Sam, name <laughs> exactly exactly his name's dark man but, you know and, i think and, like, and the original teasers were who is the dark man it was yeah. kind of played up like the shadow that's right yeah and in fact i still remember i still remember being super excited to watch that movie but you know obviously it's i think it's got more in in fav, in more in common more things in common with like a universal monster movie and like mm-hmm. or like i said dr fives like but yeah i mean it's very interesting like i i would say like i i would say doc i, I would definitely say dr fives is like it's push, it is man. revenge it's revenge but, but it's there's not, no like, other plot to it outside of trying to discover who dr fives is there's there's yeah. revenge and then the police investigation as to who's <laughs> committing the crime it's true uh so and trauma's in the eye of the beholder that they uh that's true <laughs> The, the well, then, doctors then you, let his his wife die, and so they, therefore he sees it as the doctors killed his wife. That's right. That's I mean <laughs> that's true. Uh, I'm trying to think of the um, it's the uh, Vincent Price movie where he plays like the like the Shakespearean actor. <laughs> Theater who, of Blood. Theater of Blood. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's you know like I mean that's revenge. And I guess by the end it is. I mean, he's, anyways, he's that's a, a, yeah, it's, it's different. It's definitely a sub, like, I don't know how else to define that movie. There's no traumatizing experience in theater of blood. Uh, he just, he's tired of getting bad reviews. So he starts to kill. Well, off I mean critics. the whole thing, the whole, like where they like give him the fake award to sort of, yeah, I mean, that's kind yes, of fucking yes, cruel, you're right. you're but right. it's not worth killing people. over. So. True. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to give it, I, I, I will, I'll give it that. I'll, I'll theater of blood and Doctor Fives. I <laughs> I okay, contemplated sure. Doctor Fives. Yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? Well, on the second part, we can talk. I mean, there are some straight revenge based horror movies. I mean, yeah. but not. I mean, straight cut and dried horror movies. So we can definitely talk about that. But uh, dude, like I said, I, we I think we've talked about this on multiple podcasts. We don't set out to do two parters. Like that's not <laughs> the uh, that's not the goal. But I think we get we have such a great time kind of really investigating. And I think, too, like one thing I really appreciate about this podcast is that even on those t- topics where we may not see eye to eye, I think I respect your, uh, you know, your knowledge and your intelligence and your opinion so much that I think it's always just a good conversation. Uh, just knowing like the, the your depth of knowledge and stuff uh, about film. And it's it's just always it's always a good time. Uh, I hope our audiences agree. I hope they don't, uh, they're not sick of these things turning into two parters, but again, we, we have the intention to be, I, I think we set out with the, the intention to be succinct and, you know, to move at a, at, at a pace where, you know, considerate pace for our audience. But again, we, there's just, uh, it's a big topic and there's a lot to talk about. So, yes. but I, I look forward to part two because again there are some films i didn't bring up tonight that i really do want to talk about i know there's definitely a lot with you i know there's probably even we, there's a whole subgenre we didn't even really get to that i know you, you're going to talk about you mentioned that at the beginning but we didn't actually talk too much about them uh i think you only brought up uh um true grit but anyways but yeah Devin, this is was super fun i, I always love this conversation uh i think we'll have to record this part two soon so that we're putting these out more regularly the holidays are always insane let's do part but, two soon and then uh I don't know if I have a Christmas episode in me. I think if we go till next year, because you've got a Christmas episode coming up for one of your other podcasts. Yeah, uh, I, I, that was sort of a last minute thing. I, I also think the holiday films have been so played out. If I hear one more person talk about Die Hard as a Christmas movie or, <laughs> or is or isn't a Christmas movie, I'm going to uh, pluck my own eyeballs out. But um, We may but eventually I, someday get to Christmas movies, but I, I don't think in our first year. Like Maybe, you know what though? I'm just going to put this out. Maybe I'll cut it out later. Uh, may, maybe uh, we'll we'll meet again and do the conclusion of the 
revenge films. Uh, but maybe for our end of year spectacular, we should do time travel because I think all of us want to get the fuck out of 2020. And I'm down with that. Time travel movies. Let's do it. I'm, I'm cool with that topic. All right. So we'll do time travel. Not as our next thing. Be looking for the revenge part two <laughs> electric boogaloo uh, <laughs> coming soon. Uh, we'll, we'll try to do that maybe in the next week or so. And then uh, we'll, we'll maybe do some time traveling. Uh, Going to go back in time uh, for, <laughs> for our next one. Or forwards. <laughs> for our next topic. I mean, you know. Or forwards. There are some great movies that go forwards. Uh, my favorites go backwards, though. Uh, <laughs> that's me. But it's always a pleasure. And to, to go along with what you were saying before, I really do genuinely hope that people are enjoying being let into this cinematic conversation that we've actually been having ourselves for about 20 years uh that's right but uh whether anyone's listening or not i'm gonna keep talking to you about movies because you were the guy to talk to about movies i could say the exact same thing about you uh in the meantime make sure everybody uh, if you get a chance to look us up on facebook or twitter uh we're at den of sin podcast uh i think that's it I haven't been on. <laughs> I haven't been on in a while. Not since our John Carpenter episode. Uh, like I said, it's been a strange November. But you can find us uh, anywhere that you find podcasts. You can find us on social media. Uh, please do and click that like button and let us know what you think. If there's any revenge movies we didn't cover today, which obviously there are, uh, let us know. If there's something that isn't already pre-existing on our list, if we get enough notice on something, then we'll make sure to see that and talk about it as well. But uh, until then, uh, James, do you have anything final to uh, close this out with? Uh, no, just say that, uh, you know, um, hopefully, like, if you've had some terrible things happen in your life, you've got your own level of, uh, you know, legal uh, and moral uh, re- uh, spiritual revenge, s- spiritual revenge. But hopefully everybody out there is living a happy life, having a, as good of an end of your 2020 as possible and that you don't need revenge. Life is good. And uh, just living is its own reward. Uh, hopefully. Well put. <laughs> All right, everybody join us. Uh, keep looking soon. We're going to have part two coming up and uh, we'll follow that up with some time travel till then. I will see you soon, James. Peace. <laughs>